So we're going to start by reading um, the letter to Laodicea, so Revelation chapter 13, and we're going to read from verses um, uh, 13, uh, or sorry, verse 14, right the way down, Revelation 3, Three. verse 14, right the way down to verse 22. So we'll read that around, and we'll start with Mom, and then go back to Shafe and Lisa, and back up to Ed, and we'll just keep zigzagging around. How many times? Uh, just a couple of verses each, and then we'll just kind of follow it the way around. If anybody comes, we'll just park them over here, and uh, yeah, depending if Terry right. makes it or not, and uh, we'll go from there. So uh, if you want to start, Mom, okay. Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 13, 14, sorry. And unto the angel of the ecclesia of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, open the door. I'll come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquer and sit down with my father on his throne. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. All right, so there we have the letter to Laodicea. And just a little bit about Laodicea. Um, it is uh, situated with the, the seven ecclesias. It's the last. Because if you began at Ephesus, you would travel around in a, in, a, in a clockwise fashion through the different places, and you would end up at Laodicea as the last one that would follow the trade route that would be um, in this region. So it's a city um, of a place called Phrygia. It's uh, situated on the Lycus River. It's not that far from Colossae, so we have the letter to the Colossians. And in the letter to the Colossians, it says to them to share the letter with the Laodiceans and read the letter that was sent to them. Um, so certainly that is, uh, is a, a neighboring ecclesia. So when you just put it into context of um, the, the New Testament, that would be, you know, it's like Branford and Hamilton would be sort of the, the, uh, the context there. And um, it was destroyed by an earthquake in around 66 A.D., um, and then rebuilt by the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, and it became sort of the center of the ecclesial world, um, but specifically the apostate ecclesial world. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like as the ecclesias went south or went off the rails, yeah. Laodicea arose as the leading light, but not necessarily in a good way. You know, it, it was the leading light of the ecclesias that were kind of going off the rails. Now, just to, to look at the meaning of the, the word itself, um, we've run into this before, right? Uh, remember we had Nicolaitans, right? Well, this is Laodicea, right? So it's made up of, of two words. So Laodicea, just uh, as we go through this, um, it's the Strong's number 2993, okay? Which basically is comprised of two words, the first one is laos, um, which again is uh, 2292, two, which means, or the laity, as we would use it, or the churches might use it, which is the people, right? And it can mean the, the people, the tribe, the nation, right? And the second word is dike, or dk. Um, three, actually we'll do this in the same order, um, D-I-K-E, or D-S-A, depending on how you want to pronounce it, three, two, nine, three, which means vengeance, or punishment. 
for judgment. So when you put those two things together, you have judgment of the people, which is quite fitting for where this ecclesia is at in its circumstances. So just another interesting fact is that this city is actually located on seven hills. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of typifies it, in a way, of the, the grand apostasy, um, because, of course, the, the grand apostasy is situated on seven hills as well. So it's a city that sits on seven hills. It would be destroyed. It becomes the seat of spiritual blindness, really, misery, poverty, nakedness, yeah. and eventually becomes reduced to absolute ruin. But as far as the world's concerned, it's the center of... of church life, right? And I use the word church in the proper sense of the word, right? It's not the center of ecclesial life, it's the center of church world. And that's what it becomes for a, for a period of time. So um, it's about 40 miles to the east of Ephesus, and um, pretty much it's, uh, it's a city that, that becomes one that, that really speaks to um, some of the issues. We'll talk about the geog geography later on a little bit as well when we get into this whole lukewarm thing, the cold and the hot water and stuff like that. But what I want to do is start with looking at the opening to this letter um, in verse 14. It's the angel of the ecclesia of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen. Yes, Dad? There is no connection in the laity with Latin, with uh, anything to do with the, with the Catholic. Yes. The so... Not with the word Latin, but no, the laity, right, the laity, in the Latin, the laity, right, right, you've got clergy, which is the rulers, yeah. and laity, which is the people, the ruled over. They're the ruled over. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the Greek, laos, is where yeah. that comes from, that's its root, yeah. right, which yeah. just means the common people, common people, right? So this is the judgment of the, the people, people, right? Yeah. So in this case, the people is the people of the ecclesia. Um, and it starts out as an ecclesia, but becomes very quickly uh, a church. Thank you. So we're going to start with looking at the phrase, the Amen, um, just because it is the title that is used. So when we've been going through the letters to the ecclesias, we've been looking at you know, the different titles that are given to us. Um, this case here, he uses the phrase, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation. So we're going to kind of look at those tonight in, in the titles that are given to us of the man of one, um, which of course is the Lord Jesus Christ and the, the whole ecclesial body um, that is brought together. So the word Amen um, that comes up in verse 14, actually not verse 13, yeah. okay, it is a transliteration from the Hebrew, um, which is the, uh, the original of this word. And um, if you remember Charlene, Emeth was one of the names we liked, right? So Emet is Amen, is the same thing. So in a, in a Hebrew synagogue, they will say Amen, um, because it's the same basic word um, taken from the Hebrew. So it is 281. And it literally means of a truth. So you will hear um, a notable individual, when a prayer is given in Brantford, say a very loud, Amen. Mm -hmm. Now some people in this country think that's kind of evangelical. No. It's very biblical. Um, in fact, in a lot of places, everybody says it. Because it means, I agree with what has been said. That is truth. So that was the biblical way um, that the ecclesia would respond with an amen, which basically says, I agree with this. So the reality is, that's what we should all do. It's a verbal consent to what was said in the prayer. Uh, but the, literally, the, the word in the Greek means um, that is truth, or this is truth, or of a truth. So we agree with that. So. Um, one of the things my brother James used to say, just on, you know, as we give prayers, yeah. is if you can't remember what was said at the beginning of the prayer, because it's gone on for 10 minutes, how can you possibly say amen? Yeah. 
So like, you know, God is in heaven, you're on earth, let your words be few. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to take what that prayer is into your mind, retain it in your mind to be able to agree with it at the end. We're a bit more stuffy in Brantford than they even are in Britain. Um, we should actually say amen when a prayer is given because it means I agree. This is truth. So just, you know, uh, we probably don't because the evangelical world is amen and it all over the place. Um, but that actually isn't a wrong thing. You know, it becomes kind of that more of a, an apostrophe um, from the audience. But it is actually saying, I agree, this is true. You know, and um, there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's actually right. Um, but we tend to not do that. But nonetheless, there it is. It's, it's their meaning, this is truth. But here it's used, in this case here, it is a title, right? Um, it's used as a title of Christ or the man of one. He is, in he is entitled the Amen, right? So that's what this is in this case here. Now, let's just take a look at that, how it works out, because again, when we're looking at the book of Revelation, this title will come up again. Um, the rest of the name is going to come up again. It's going to come up later on in the chapter, so or in the book. So when we get there, we want to have put it into context and understand what it is. So let's take a look at John chapter 14 in verse 6. So John chapter 14, in verse 6, um, this is one of the uses of this um, in its true import, right? So this isn't the word amen, but this is the meaning of it. So I can't remember where we got to. Uh, Charlene. Charlene? Okay, so Charlene, if you want to read John chapter 14 in verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Okay. So here is the answer that's given. I am the truth. And that's what amen means. So it's like saying, I am the amen. Right? I am the truth. Right? I am the amen. I am the way. I am the life. Nobody can come to the Father but by me. This is that exact expression, right? It's not the exact same word, but it's the same import of meaning. So when he says, I'm the truth, it's the same thing. It's not the same word because the, the word is Greek, right? Whereas amen is a transliteration straight from the Hebrew. We talk about transliterations of words like Gehenna, the valley of the son of Hinnom, mm -hmm. uh, Armageddon, um, which is a phrase, or both of those are really phrases. So this is his title. We've already come across it in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. So let's go back there. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. So, Dad, I think it's your turn. Right. And when I saw him, I felt his feet is dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Uh, one more verse, actually, 17 and 18. Oh, sorry. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So here is the expression, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Right? And what he's saying is, I am the truth. Right? I am the amen. I'm alive forevermore. Um, that is an expression of truth. So he's alive forevermore. Which is the amen or the truth. Now we're going to look at why he would say that. Um, why we'd actually use that. But basically what he's saying is I am the first and the last. I'm the one that was alive, the one that uh, was, uh, sorry, uh, I'm he that liveth and was dead. Now he lives forevermore. He's the amen. He has the keys of, of hell and of death. So as an individual, he was the amen or the truth. He's an expression of the truth of the Father. And that is that God promised to raise him from the dead. And he did. So the fact that he's alive makes him the living proof 
right? He's the truth, right? So this is just, if you're just trying to get your head around how this works, right? How does that make him the amen? Because he's alive forevermore. God promised that. He's going to raise him the third day. He did raise him the third day. He lives forevermore. So he stands as a witness to the truth. He is the amen, okay? So in that sense, he's the faithful witness, which we'll come and look at in a moment, because uh, that phrasing is going to come up. But let's go back then to uh, 2 Corinthians 1. Verse 20. Yes, verses 19 to 20. 2 Corinthians, verses 19 to 20, chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. I have that already. I was going to be asking you to turn to that one, because I had that one wrong. Right on. Okay, Fred, you're up, if you're game for it. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 19 to 20. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever. I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Brother Fred? Second Corinthians. Oh, Second Corinthians. This is chapter yeah. one. Uh, <coughs> That's okay. No, that was correct. Me. You had me confused for a minute there, but. Oh, it's all right. I thought you said First Corinthians. First Corinthians. Second Corinthians one and verse nineteen. Second Corinthians. For we have only hope in Christ in this life. We are of all men most to be pitied. But now Christ, Sorry, Fred. No, it's for me, my dear. Second Corinthians, chapter one. Yeah. Verse oh. nineteen. One chapter out. <laughs> You're getting there, Fred. I'm getting there. Second Corinthians. Glad you stopped. Oh. Second Corinthians, chapter one, verse nineteen and twenty. Nineteen and twenty. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us by me, and Sylvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in him. For as many as may be promises, may, may be promises of God, in him they are yes. Wherefore also by him is our amen. amen. To the glory of God through us. Okay. Now, that's a confusing little verse. You know, you probably found that. Like, it's kind of like, what exactly does that mean? Um, I don't know if... Uh, I have the ESV. In front you have the ESV in yes. front of you? Yes. Right here on my phone. On the phone? Yeah. I have both verses. Okay. And cross-reference. Can you just pass it to me for a second? The other one's right there, Jonathan. Is it over there? Yeah. Okay, so let me just read you the ESV. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was proclaimed, who we proclaim among you, that is Sylvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it's always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to the glory of God. Right? So it's a little bit clearer. Mm -hmm. um, That's the first time that amen was used, by the way. Yes. So, in the sense of this then, what he's saying is, in Christ, all the promises are, amen, are true. right, are true, yeah. because they become true in him, right? So then when we talk about, did Christ benefit from his own sacrifice? Well, of course he did, because he absolutely has to have completed the process that his father set out. On this level, it's, there's no re, er, uh, inheritance for him if he doesn't smite sin death, right? If he doesn't complete the process, it is the truth being completed in him. Genesis 3.15 and all those other passages. So we don't need to get into all the wrangling over all the, the other stuff, but he's the amen in the sense that he completes all the promises through his sacrifice and through his life and through his resurrection. Right? So he is the statement of truth. Right? That is the golden thread from beginning to end yes. of the Bible. Correct. Yeah. It is. 
So if you want to just phrase that in your mind differently, um, or not necessarily differently, but just sort of like paraphrase it, all the promises... Genesis 15 and 6. All the promises of the deity... in Jesus are Amen or they're trustworthy and believable truth or they're made into truth if you know what I mean like the truth is completed in them it's one thing to say something it's another thing to prove it they are proved in him so he becomes the statement of truth Hence, I am the truth, the way, the life. Yeah. No man comes to the Father but by me. So all the promises of the deity in the Lord Jesus Christ are amen. In other words, they're all fulfilled. That's why in him it is yes, yes. It's not yes and no. Right? Everything's completed in him. Right? It's amen. If they weren't fulfilled, it would be yes and no. Right? Some things are, some things aren't, or whatever. But it is yay, yay, not yay and no. You know, like it's yes and yes, right? Not just salvation by his name, but the promises relating to Judah, Israel, Jerusalem, the hope of the kingdom that's coming to the Jews, and not just those fulfilled at his first coming, but those that are going to be fulfilled at his second coming. So he will be yay, yay, because everything is completed in him. He's the beginning of the creation. All things are, are for his sake, right? So it all comes together in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is the truth spoken of by the Father. So when we read that phrase, I am the way, the truth, and the life, what it's saying is more than just I'm real. Mm -hmm. It's saying I am the fulfillment of the truth, of all the promises from start to finish. They're all fulfilled in him. From Abraham on down. From well, Genesis, yep. Abraham, Noah, you know, like all of that is all fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm the truth going forward. I'm eternity. I am. And the thing is, it's not only that, but the promise that the, all the things that will be fulfilled in the kingdom that are not yet fulfilled will also be completed in him. So he becomes the earnest, uh, the if you want to call it, right? <laughs> he's, the, he's the deposit. He's the proof. Mm -hmm. of what God has said now and what God has said in the future. So that's why when you look at him, I'm alive forevermore, I'm the amen, I'm the truth, right? Because that fact establishes what God has told us is true. Yeah. And that sacrifice that he performed, if you want to call it seals, the promises is truth. You know what I mean? Like if, you, if you go to, you know, you can write a document out, um, and then you have to have it notarized, right? It has to be impressed with a seal. Well, the Lord's sacrifice impresses the promises of God with that seal, so to speak, um, because it's now proven, it's authenticated. Um, not that God needed authenticating, but He is the fulfillment of that. So it's just something to kind of get your head around. When we read that phrase, we don't always apply to it everything that's, that is meant by it. So... But that's the mercy of God when you say God didn't need to authenticate anything. No, you're right, he didn't. But he condescended Correct. Um, to tent in his son. You know? Yes. Genesis 15 and verse 6. And he, which is Abraham, believed in him, in the Lord. And he reckoned it Just make sure you bang to him bunch of as righteousness. Mm -hmm. That was right from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we now come to the next phrase, now that I've shaped and snatched that for us. I should gonna hold on to that and then you can just bang on the Um we want to now come to the next phrase, which is the faithful witness. So he's the Amen, right? He is the truth. Um, but he also stands as the faithful witness, right? So that's an, an important kind of add-on to this title. Um, it's not an entirely separate um, component. It's kind of a, 
a further development of that. So it's the faithful and the true witness. So you've got the amen, and then we get the phrase, the faithful and true witness. So, again, we want to just look at the words. Um, we're familiar with certainly a couple of these. Um, faithful is the first one. So that's the Strong's number 4103. We've looked at it several times. It's the word pistos in the Greek. And it basically means trustworthy. <coughs> um, that's really probably, I mean, the other things that they give you is um, those who show themselves faithful in business. So it's kind of proven, I guess you could say. Um, it's not just, uh, you know, take my word, you can trust this. It's, it's proven to be trustworthy. It's, it's demonstrated. Um, somebody who is faithful in business, in charge of an office, uh, worthy of the trust of others. Okay, so that's the idea of, of faithful in that sense. Okay, then you get the word true. So that's faithful. Then we have true, which is the Strong's number 228, which is alethanos, which again, um, this is, the definition is, that which has not only the name and the resemblance, but the real nature corresponding to the name in every respect corresponding to the idea signified. True, really genuine, opposite to what is fictitious, counterfeit, imaginary, uh, stimulated, or simply pretended. So it's really the idea of a genuine... 100%. Yeah. Jonathan, is that one word, alethanos? Yeah. Okay. It's the Greek, basically... Uh, and it, it's the idea, basically, of genuine. Okay. Gen, genuineness, not counterfeit, I guess would be a good... To put it, sometimes it's helpful... Not knockoff. Yeah. The unreproof. Sometimes I find it's, it's helpful to put the, the opposite in there. Because mm -hmm. um, it just helps to kind of establish the meaning. So it's not counterfeit. It is genuine in its nature. In every respect, basically. Now the third word... So there's faithful and true, is this word witness. Now, do you remember that before? We looked at this in one of the other letters. There was a character who was called the witness, right? Do you remember what his name was? Antipas. Antipas, right. So this is that same word, not Antipas, but witness, which is martus, from which... We get the word martyr, but it's not what we think of by the word martyr. When we think of martyr, we think of somebody burning at the stake. Um, that's not what a martyr really is, although a martyr could be somebody who, because of their witnesses, that happens to. But it's a witness in a legal sense. So you think about that, it's somebody, it's a spectator who recounts a testimony. So, I used to be a court sketcher once upon a lifetime. They would call the witness to the stand. Yeah. That's the way in which this word martyr is really used in the scripture. But everywhere you read the martyr... It is the same word witness. So it's somebody who actually takes the stand and testifies, right? They give a, a testimony. Somebody who has been involved in something who gives a verbal testimony to the truth of something. So he is a faithful, a trustworthy, a proven, and genuine testifier or testator or witness that's called to the stand. So you can think of witnesses that are called to the stand... And there's lots of witnesses that come to the stand that are not genuine. They're making it up. They're false witnesses. They've been paid. They're like, you know what I mean? Like, for whatever reason, 
uh, than not giving a faithful witness. The Lord Jesus Christ is the exact opposite of that. He is the faithful and true witness. Um, so let's just go to a couple of passages on this. John chapter 3 and verses 10 through 13 is the first one. This title will come up again in Revelation, um, and we want to make sure that we're, we're understanding it and what it's talking about when we get to it eventually, right? But this sort of lays that foundation for us as we go through it. So John chapter 3 uh, and verse 10 down to verse 13, if you just want to read that for us, Mom. Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So those two words are both rooted in that word martus. Right? So he says, we speak what we know, right? And testify, which is martyrio, what we have seen. Right? So he says, I'm telling you what's been revealed to me. I am martyrio, I am witnessing what I've seen. Okay? And you don't receive our witness. So he testifies what he's seen, but they're not receiving that witness. Right? So they're not listening to the witness that's been given. But the Lord is giving this witness. And he says, look, if you can't even hear earthly things, how are you going to hear heavenly things? So, but this is him giving that faithful witness. So he's telling them here, look, um, I, in, a, in a legal sense of the word, so to speak, I am telling you what I've seen. I am being the one who is a spectator who is recounting the testimony. Right, so that, that phrase there is kind of demonstrated in John chapter 3. He's been called to the stand. He says, I'm giving you my witness. I'm giving you my testimony. And you don't believe it. So, but the Lord is the faithful and the true witness. Okay? So let's go to the fact that he witnesses um, to the gospel message. Um, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 15. then verse 19, and then verse 43. So you get the mother load, Shane. Uh, <clears throat> and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a, er, a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Yeah, that's right, 19. Yeah, and, uh, and he said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for therefore am I sent. So here you have him teaching. Let <laughs> me put it there. Preach the kingdom. So when he comes to give his testimony, what is it? Well, he is teaching in the synagogue. He is preaching the acceptable year of the Lord. He is preaching the kingdom of God. So when he came and gave his testimony, what that testimony was was all about the kingdom of God coming on earth. That's what he's testifying to. Right? So here is his testimony that he's going to give. It's teaching, preaching the acceptable year of the Lord and preaching the kingdom of God. So when he comes to give his testimony, it's not just coming to just blabber on about anything incoherently. He has a specific purpose that he's coming to do. And that is to relay the message that he's just told us he's heard, 
and his witness is true, but you won't listen to it. What I've heard of my father, I'm going to come and tell you. Well, what did he hear of his father? Well, he preaches what he heard, which is the acceptable year of Lord, the kingdom of God that's coming. So that's his testimony, right? So that testimony goes forward from here. If you just want to take a shot of that, actually, now, Shafin. Um, because we're going to, we want to just kind of develop this thought out a little bit, because he comes before Pilate, and he has to give the same testimony, right? He comes and he actually lays out before Pilate what this testimony is, and he's, he's questioned on this. So we're going to go to um, Matthew chapter 26. I'll leave the bottom part on there for now. Matthew chapter 26. And we want to read uh, a little section there, verses 62 down to 64. said unto him, Answer thou nothing. What is this which these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, and coming in the clouds of heaven. Okay, so here you have him on trial. Before Caiaphas first, and the question is, tell us if you are the Christ, which of course is the Messiah, the Son of God. And Christ's answer, thou hast said, yes, I am. So when, when asked the question, he gives a faithful and true witness. He doesn't deny it. He doesn't duck it. He just says yes, basically. Or in the phrasing here, thou hast said. You said it. Right? So he agrees with what Caiaphas questions him on and sort of like the guiltiest charge, so to speak, of, of the, um, the statement that's been made. But the interesting thing is that that trial doesn't just end there. Right? The trial goes on. And he's then be brought before Pilate. So John chapter 18 and verse 33 to 37. So John 18 verses 30, I say? 33 to 37. So the first trial is before Caiaphas. The second trial is before Pilate, or the high priest, as he's called. Okay, so John chapter 18, Ed, if you want to read that for us, starting at verse 33, and then we'll go down to verse uh, 37. Okay, so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this to you, this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I may not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not for this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king, Jesus answered. You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listeners to, listens to my voice. Okay, so we just pick it up here. Thanks, Ed. You're welcome. <clears throat> Remember his title. He is the faithful and the true witness. Okay, so what is he witnessing? Caiaphas, are you the Christ, the Son of God? 
the Messiah? You said it. Pilate, are you the king of the Jews? And he asks it a couple of times, right? The Lord's answer, thou sayest I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this purpose came I into the world. To do what? To bear witness, which is that word martyrio, to the truth. So he stands before Pilate, and he literally bears witness to the truth. And he says, everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So those who are of the truth are going to listen to what he has to say. So he stands there, and he speaks the truth. Right? So he bears witness to the truth. Now, the point is, in this... Um, uh, just a takeaway for us is this. The Lord tells us, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Right? You don't need to swear. You don't need to, like, okay, this is a real truth now. You know, like, you know, this is everything else I've told at this point is not really the truth, but now I'm going to tell you the real truth. He says, let you, yeah, the honest truth. And we do that, oh, to be honest, or I've got to be honest. Well, why don't you be honest all the time? Like, you know, it's kind of a phrase that we need to sort of, we, 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 I mean, I know I'll, I'll say it, well, like, you know, to be honest, well, like, what, are you not usually honest? Like, you know, and that's where you just have to kind of listen to what you're saying. But the Lord Jesus Christ stands before Pilate and Caiaphas and gives the honest to God and its true meaning, truth. This is, this is the truth. But he uh, always spoke that way. Pilate was hit between the drugstore and the alley and didn't know what to do after that. <laughs> well, and the thing is, is that that's the way we've got to be. Yep. We've got to be faithful yep. and true witnesses in everything, even to our hurt. So if somebody asks you, where were you? And you or say, to their hurt, brutally honest. Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> looks are deceiving. <laughs> So you can redirect, um, but like when it comes to just our conversation, like our, our language, our, whether that's at work or in the ecclesial world or whatever it is, we have to be true, right? We have to be faithful and true witnesses. Interesting here is what Christ has pressed on, the issues that he's talking about here. Are you the Christ, the Son of God, and are you the King of the Jews, right? And he bears a faithful witness. He doesn't duck it. He doesn't hide from it, and it results in his crucifixion, but he gives a faithful and true witness. Now, I just want you to come back, because, you know, John chapter 5, we have a great section here, and, and if you uh, were present for Matt Norton's classes, I think it was Matt Norton that did this, um, he really pressed this point home. So, John chapter 5, and um, we want to come in at verse 31. Um, so, this is the Lord Jesus Christ who is giving testimony, and um, through this testimony, he basically is being questioned and whatever else. But he makes some, some pretty critical points. So we're going to follow John through. So first of all, John chapter 5, in verse 31, he makes a statement. So who's next? I am. Okay. In John chapter 5, at verse 31, it reads, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another... Oh, do I keep going? No, you stop there for now. Okay. If I bear witness of myself... If it's fell, it would be great. My testimony is not true. This witness is not true. Okay? Now that's not entirely true, because the Lord's witness is true, right? Like he's not saying, if, if it's me saying it, it's not true. It was true, but it doesn't stand up in the Jewish court of law, is what he's saying, right? He's not saying, I'm not telling you the truth if I say it. Like he's saying, if it's just me saying this, it doesn't hold legal authority, because there's a principle involved. And we're going to go back and look at that principle. Two passages, Numbers 20, or 35, verse 30. So we want to compare where he's driving us to go. Is Numbers, back to the law, in chapter 35 and verse 30. And then the one after that is going to be Deuteronomy 
chapter 17, verses 6 to 7. So Shoshana and Charlene, if you want to take those between you. Oh, you and Josiah? Okay, so Charlene, uh, Numbers 35, 20, 30. Josiah, Deuteronomy 17, 6 to 7. Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. Okay, Josiah, Deuteronomy 17, verses 6 to 7. Most of two witnesses or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. The hands of the witnesses shall be first upon him to put him to death, and after afterwards the hands of all the people, so thou shalt put the evil away from him. Okay, so do you see the principle there? Yep. Like you couldn't condemn a man to death by one man's testimony, yep. right? You, you couldn't do that. Um, it had to be in the mouth of two or three witnesses, and then they were the ones who had to throw the first stone, right? So whoever was the witness um, was the one who had to be the first to, to cast that stone. But the principle drawn out of this is that it's not one witness that qualifies an accusation or substantiates a statement, right? So the, this, the context of this is the, the law of the avenger, the ga'al, right, where the, the avenger of blood would come. That's the, that's the context of this. But there's a principle to this that Christ draws out, right? And we're going to go look at that principle now. And it's just interesting in this because... Under the law, and a lot of people are very critical of the law of Moses, you know, we have that book, Faith versus Legalism, um, which is kind of a criticism um, of the law of Moses. But the reality is, um, in, in, in that book, and I'm just sort of giving you an idea, this is where, we, and the reason I bring this up is because we, we get into this in a, as a community. People say, oh, it's very legalistic. Mm -hmm. Well, the problem with that book is the writer's Jewish, so he's looking at the law, through the Jewish interpretation of the law, okay, which was askew. So the interpretation of the law was wrong, but the law wasn't wrong. The law is holy and true and just, right? Mm -hmm. What they twisted to it at the time of the Lord's life was wrong. He didn't come to destroy the law, he came to fulfill it. So the principles of the law are just, holy, and true. How people wrangled with them is really where things went wrong. So the way they twisted it and turned it to work in their benefit or against somebody else um, was really what was wrong with the law, not the law itself. It was what man did to it. So usually if God creates something, it's, it's very good. Um, it's man who messes it up, right? Yeah. So let's go to um, Matthew chapter 18. Verses 15 to 16. So this is where Christ takes that principle from down here. Matthew 18, verses 15 to 16. Out of the context of the, um, the situation of, of murder and of passing sentence of death. And he lifts that and he reapplies it into the case of a brother who has committed a trespass. And you have this fault, and there's this discussion that's going on. So we're going to go to Matthew chapter 18, and verses 15 to 16. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, and go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall bear thee, thou shalt have gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more that the mouth of two or more three witnesses, or two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Amen. Okay, so notice the principle now. And he takes this up and uses it 
um, back in this John passage. Okay, so he's picked this section out of the Law of Moses, where you couldn't just have one witness, you needed two or three. And he's grabbed that, and he's reapplied it in Matthew chapter 18, in the case of an offense between brethren that's going to get then dealt with, with the, with the ecclesia, with the congregation. Um, not for the purpose of stoning or anything like that, or putting someone to death now, but for, for passing sentence in an ecclesial environment. And he says that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established, right? So it's not good enough just to have one person to um, make an accusation. It has to be corroborated, is the word we use today, by two or three people. So that's why in an ecclesial life, you don't just have, you know, somebody makes an accusation and then you just hang somebody. You know what I mean? Like, spiritually speaking, you know, it shouldn't be that way. You need to have done diligent inquiry, as it says under the law, and you go forward with that. Now, Christ takes this principle and applies it to himself, but it's also picked up elsewhere in the New Testament. So we're just going to look at a couple examples, then we'll come back to the way he applies it to himself. So um, the principle then... In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. And the other thing is it protects the brother against false um, accusation, malicious prosecution, as we would call it. Um, and we need to uphold that in our dealings one with another. You can't have somebody's character assassinated on just gossip, on the say-so of somebody. Right. So when it's, when it's used ecclesially, so Paul picks this up now, in 1 Timothy... Um, chapter 5 and verse 19. 1 Timothy, chapter 5 and verse 19. Fred, if you want to read that out for us. Yep. <clears throat> Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Okay, so I'm going to read you the ESV. Do not admit a charge against an elder except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Okay, so here you have this expression, don't receive an accusation. And the word there to receive means to acknowledge, right? So to receive is this idea of acknowledge. So you don't take an accusation and sort of like, you know, oh, well that's, that's something that, you know, we need to take into account. You actually don't receive it to yourself. You don't, you don't accept that. And you say, well, have you taken anybody with you to talk to so-and-so? You know, especially if it's an elder, so if you've taken a couple of people with you to talk to an elder brother or an arranging brother or whatever you're going to call it today, um, an older brother, and, and you're not getting anywhere, well then three brethren can say, look, we've tried to work with brother so-and-so, but they're not getting anywhere. But just for some, somebody to come along and say, well, look, you know, i got this problem with brother so-and-so, um, and, uh, and uh, have you tried to talk to him? Have you taken anybody with you? You shouldn't receive that accusation but with two or three witnesses. So that's the way we should behave ourselves together. You don't listen to a charge except uh, with two or three witnesses. Now that means you have to go employ those two or three witnesses, and you have to say, come with me, please. I want to talk to this brother. Um, so you do have to obviously um, get them involved. But that's how it's used by the Apostle Paul. So he grabs what the Lord has said, and he applies it now for the prosecution of an elder, let's say. Okay? But I want to show you how the Lord Jesus Christ now picks it up, this principle, and applies it to himself. Right? Because here he says, if I bear witness of myself, this is back in John chapter 5, verse 31, mm -hmm. my witness is not true. Now, he doesn't mean my witness isn't true. It's not corroborated. Right? So we're talking about the corroboration mm -hmm. of the testimony, because all these words, witnesses, are this word martyrio, or martyr. Right? They are a faithful witness, or they're a witness, and they, hopefully they're a faithful one. So the Lord Jesus Christ goes through and he lays out who his witnesses are. So number one okay, was himself, because he 
has borne witness. So he stands as the first of the witnesses, okay? So witness number one is Christ. And we looked at when he gave his testimony, two of the times. Uh, he went out and spoke about the gospel and whatever else. He spoke before Pilate, spoke before Caiaphas. He gave a faithful and true witness. Witness number two is John the Baptist. And we want to look at a couple of passages that demonstrate this to us. So we have John chapter 5, because that's where we are. And it's verse 20, or, sorry, uh, 32 to 33. So, Mom, I think it is. John chapter 5. So he's told us, if I bear witness of myself, um, it's not credible if it's just me. Right? So you have to have two or three witnesses. So the Lord Jesus Christ then says, well, here's my witnesses. John the Baptist is one of them. John chapter 5, verses 32 to 33. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. He sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. Okay, so here we have a true witness. You sent to John, and he bare witness of the truth. So we just want to look at when he actually did this. Let's go back to John chapter 1. Verses 35 to 36. John chapter 1, verses 35 to 36. This is John the Baptist giving that witness now. Again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So, there's his statement. For the two witnesses. Behold, the Lamb of God. Yeah, as Fred says, in front of a couple of other witnesses. Mm -hmm. Now, Lisa, if you can read John 3. It's a little bit longer section. It's verse 28 to 36. Um, but just listen carefully to what John has to say. Because he's being put on the witness stand now, and he's being asked, well, are you the Messiah? And he's going to give his testimony. Ye yourselves bear me witness, but I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man <clears throat> receiveth his testimony. He that receiveth his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So it's a bit of a section, but just listen to what John has said. He yes. says, you ask me, am I the one? And he says, I'm not. So he's not claiming falsely to be the Messiah, first of all. Mm -hmm. okay? He's denying that he's the one. And then he turns around and he says, well, the Son of God, right? So he calls Jesus Christ the Son of God. But he says, look, um, if, you, if you go back to what he says, uh, he that cometh from above is above all, right? He speaketh, or he that cometh from heaven is above all. What he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, right? And nobody receives his testimony. So he's actually testifying about the Lord's testimony, not only is he saying he's the Christ, the Lamb of God, but he's testifying about the Lord's testimony and saying it's true. That's the test of a true prophet. Yeah, he's corroborating what Christ has said. So he says, what he, hath er, he that receiveth his testimony hath this to his seal that God is true. Right? And then he goes on to say, for who God has sent, 
uh, speaketh the words of God. So John is a testimony, or a testifier of the truth of the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. So come back to John chapter 5, um, and let's take a look at verse 36. Enter witness number 3. <laughs> So John chapter 5 and verse 36. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish the very works that I am doing. Bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Okay, so here he tells you his works bear witness. So in this case, his works are a testimony. I mean, remember when, when John sends his disciples, and I think John sends them for their benefit, not John's, right? Um, and the Lord, and they say to John, Are thou he that cometh, or do we look for another, right? And the Lord says, well, go tell John what you've seen. You know, the dead are raised. Mm -hmm. The blind receive their sight. The deaf hear, so on and so forth. Taking them back to Isaiah and drilling into these young disciples that, yeah, he is the Messiah. Right? So the works, they bear witness. They testify of me. So then we come down to the next witness. And that's John chapter 5 and verse 37. <laughs> And the Father himself, which has sent me, has borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. So, okay, if that's not good enough, we now have witnessed him before, which is the Father. The Father, which has sent me, has bear, borne witness of me. Well, when did he do that? Well, there was a couple of times he did that. Um, Matthew chapter 3... And verse 17. And then the other one is uh, Luke 9, verses 3 to 33 to 35. Luke, or Matthew 3 and 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Right, so there's the father. Can't get any more this than that. is my beloved son. Right? So the father bears him witness from heaven in front of everybody. And then Luke chapter 9, verse 33 to 35. As they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias, not knowing what he said. Well, he thus spake, there came a cloud, and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. So again, before three witnesses now, this is my beloved son, hear him. And what does Peter relate about this? Well, we'll look at that in a moment. Um, but basically, he turns around and says, this is my beloved son. So the Father from heaven bears witness of the Son, right? Back to John, chapter 9, or 5, sorry, in verse 39... We have witness number five. So, Dad, if you want to read that one for us. John chapter five and verse 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. So there you have the scriptures testify of me. So you begin to see the weight of him saying that he's the faithful and the true witness. Right? It's not just him saying this. 
It's John, it's the works, it's the Father, it's the Scripture, right? But it's not done there. Verse 46, witness number 6. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. So Moses wrote of me. So he's also a testifier. And it's just helpful, that's something I did in my margin, or not in my margin, in the Bible, it's just to take these passages and just color them in and just write them out. Witness number one, witness number two, witness number three, witness number four, witness number five, witness number six. And of course, witness number seven, um, we'll have to put it on the next board, but it comes later on. And we'll, we'll end with that witness tonight. If you can just take a shot of that shape real quick. I'll leave the bottom part on there, because we're just going to need the top part here. Interesting, that's just the third Passover. This is the end of the, the year, the Sabbath year. Yeah. At this point. So, the passage I was referring to earlier, we now get into the apostles. Right? The apostles were also witnesses. The Christ, the Christ did not... I mean, in this point here... He's telling you who the witnesses are, but the other ones who come about are the apostles. So number seven, witnesses, or witness number seven is the apostles, and we read of that in um, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. And all these words, by the way, Every time it uses the word witness or testify, it's this word maturio, or a, or a form of it, right? So it's using that constantly over and over again. So uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. I can't remember what we got up to. Judas. Right, finished? Oh, I don't remember yeah. now. Okay. Judas. Mom? Yeah, yeah. it's you. Yeah. For well, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So they are eyewitnesses of the testimony of the Father that he is a faithful witness. You see what I mean? Like it's sort of like it's interlinked, but yeah. he says there, look, we are the eyewitnesses. We were there. We heard this voice in the mount, and he says we're faithful witnesses. We haven't call it, followed cunningly devised fables when we made this known to you. This is not a bunch of stories. We didn't lie on the stand. We told you the truth. So... This is a faithful witness. Um, let's go to first of John. Now, so that's Peter. He was one of the people that was there. The Apostle John was also there. And first John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, he gives his testimony to this as well. So 1 John chapter 1, in the first five, five verses... And I want you to listen to this in terms of a courtroom, okay? So think of what John's now saying, because we've been talking about bringing up witnesses to the stand. So far we've had Christ, we've had the, the, uh, John the Baptist, the works, the Father, the Scripture, Moses, the Apostle Peter's been there. Now the Apostle John's going to give his testimony, and this is what he has to say. So first of John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. What was from the beginning... What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we behold and our hands handle concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have, been, we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father, and it was manifest in us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, 
that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. And this is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. So if you got a color pencil, mm -hmm. just color in these words, because this is the testimony, right? He says, yep. that which we have, was from the beginning, we have heard, right? So you think of now giving testimony as we looked at, mm -hmm. somebody who has been there, they've been an eyewitness or whatever. So he says, we've heard it, we have seen with our eyes, is the next phrase in there. We have looked upon, so they've heard it, they've seen it, they've fixed their eyes on it, they've touched it, our hands have handled, right? It was manifested, we have seen it, and we bear witness. Well, guess what that word is? Marturio, right? We bear witness and show unto you. And later on, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. And then later on, this is the message which we heard of him, which we're declaring to you. So you can see how the John says, look, we have seen, heard, touched, like we were there. We, this is exactly um, like the words of Peter. We were not following cunningly devised fables, but we're passing on to you what we've learned. So, Shafer, if you want to take Acts chapter 1, verses 21 to 22, this is when the apostles were picking a replacement for Judas, who was not a faithful witness, right? He's the one who went and betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ. So now they're going to pick a replacement. And now let's look at the qualifications for the replacement. Right. Wherefore, of these men which have campaigned with us uh, all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, being from the baptism of John unto the same day that he was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. Okay, so notice the qualification. They have to have been there. They have to have been accompanied or companions with him from the time that Christ went out at the beginning from the baptism of John until he was taken away. They had to have been there and seen it all. Why? So that they could be a witness with us of his resurrection. So they had to have seen his death. They had to have seen his baptism, Excellent. all his works. One. It's Acts chapter 1, sorry, Fred, verses 21, 21 to 22. So they were to be a witness of the resurrection. You know, Jonathan, that was a point that uh, a brother, let me just think of who it is. I probably won't be able to on the spot. Um, but um, it was a brother teaching on Paul and saying that in order for Paul to have become who he did, he would have had to have been there yes. from the get-go of Christ's ministry. So in the synagogue, and there's some suggestion that because Jesus was so, um, uh, he, he was so right on that it exasperated Paul. Yeah. And that's why he became kind of... When you take that qualification, yes. it based, does intimate that Paul, Saul at the time, mm -hmm. would have been there mm -hmm. from the very beginning mm -hmm. in some form or another. Yeah. Which, if you look at his career, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Yes. So when you read of a Pharisee came to him and said, it's quite possible that one of those could have been Saul. Mm -hmm. um, but he was certainly in the company of. Mm -hmm. They watched him. They took counsel together. He would have sat in on that counsel. He would have been a part of that whole scene. Because he learned at the feet of Gamaliel, who's yeah. the one that said, you know, if this guy is of God... Yeah, we're not going to be able to stop it. We're not going to be able to stop it. That, yeah. was, his, that was his instruction. But how, what's, how beautiful is it that Jesus, who tangled with the Pharisees, yes. picked from among 
took right out of their midst yeah. their star student oh, star. Yes. Yes. and turned him into his apostle. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's going to tell you, you know, in all our ecclesial battles that go on, God can change anybody. Yep. You know, sometimes we, we write somebody off. We absolutely say that person is, is done. Well, Saul, for all intents and purposes, was done. But God took him, changed him, and employed him. Yes, Ed? Um, when you, in Acts 1 and 21 and 22, when you were saying the witness of resurrection of his disciples, of his apostles, they also would have witnessed the resurrection of Lazarus, too. They would have, yeah, Lazarus. And then um, they would have seen Lazarus. There was the young lady that was raised. There was the man that was uh, carried out on the co- in the coffin and the beard. So there was like several resurrections, mm-hmm. three of them. Yeah. That they would have witnessed before the Lord Jesus Christ even came along. But see that see how pride just seeds, right? But it's overcomable. Yeah. By the word. Yeah. Right? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's mm-hmm. hard for you to kick against the goats. Mm-hmm. Now notice how many witnesses there are? Tons. Seven. 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 Christ, John the Baptist, the works, the Father, the Scripture, Moses, and the Apostles. There are seven witnesses. What about the disciples? In the mouth of two or three witnesses mm-hmm. shall every word be established. He has the perfect number of witnesses. I was wondering when you're going to go beyond three come under. Yeah, <laughs> to seven. But that's, seven. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So there are seven witnesses. So when it says he's the faithful and the true witness, it's not an individual witness. It's corroborated mm-hmm. by More than three. all of this. More than three. Right? And that's where you and I also become witnesses. Mm-hmm. Are we faithful witnesses? Mm-hmm. Perfect number. Right? Seven. That's what we have to be. We have to be witnesses. Yes, Shirley? How about at our judgment? Well, this is the question, right? Whosoever denies me, I will deny him. Mm-hmm. Well, because it, life in the kingdom is based on truth. You can't, <laughs> you can't get around it. it. And, and that has a practical outworking because... Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes we're in a place where it's as simple as giving a prayer for a meal. Yep. Yep. You know, and, and sometimes you're like, oh, I'm with a business person. This could be awkward, whatever. And you don't. You know what I mean? Like, no. there's no excuse. It doesn't bother me. I happen to know somebody in the room who came into the truth because somebody gave a prayer for a meal in a pub. Yep. And if that person hadn't have given a prayer for a meal in a pub, and he's not the most upstanding young example, but because he was honest to his God and was not ashamed of his Lord and gave that prayer, Dad came into the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a faithful witness. And the result of that little act is that the gospel is preached. You see how this witnessing part of it, Mm -hmm. this is so huge Mm -hmm. and it can be something so small as just a little act like giving a quiet prayer for a meal. Yeah. Yes, Sean. Well, we have, like God sees everything with us. Christ sees everything with, with us. But then I was also thinking, you know when you were saying about another witness he has was the, his work for bearing witness? Yes. How about, um, by their fruits you shall know them. So it's also by our fruits. And yes. We do as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, well, and that's, that becomes... They'll witness hypocrisy, too. They'll witness hypocrisy if we don't witness. That's what will witness to us at the judgment seat as well, right? So this is, this is the witness of Christ being the Messiah. But again, our witness to that fact in our works, in our actions, whatever it might be, is what's going to basically be called to, to our trial, so to speak. You know, are we faithful witnesses to him? And so I think we'll leave it there for tonight. I need some peach cobbler after all that. <laughs> wow. Yes, Dad. What what what's the menu for next uh, next Monday? <laughs> or, uh, so menu. next one Monday, we're going to look at the next phrase, which is the beginning of the creation. Yeah, the beginning of creation. Because this is one of the themes of Revelation: is those who are sealed of God in the forehead, right? So beyond. The beginning of the creation is the next phrase in that. So this is his titles. These are the titles of the man of one. Yeah. And one of them is that he's the beginning of the creation. This takes us far beyond Abraham. Yeah. All the way back to the start. So take away from this has to be 
Um, you know, like there's the titles of Christ. We've only done a few words, so to speak. But there's a huge exhortation in this for us, and that is to be a faithful witness in everything that we do. Just like all of these testified of Christ, that we have to testify of our Lord to his truth. And that means in the ecclesias, when we run into a problem, and, you know, there is truth that needs to be said, we have to be faithful witnesses. It means at work, it means in family life, when we do things that are wrong and we go down an alleyway that we shouldn't be down, we need to be faithful and say, no, we need to witness to this and get out of this and go a different direction. It's, it's about being honest at school, at work, in everything that we do, and it's those little things that testify to the truth that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I think we'll, we'll end there. In